Namaste and good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank, thank you so much for TEDx Choice School to having me here. And thank you so much for giving this opportunity to share and tell my story with you. So I have some video for you guys first. It was really hard to breathe. It was really hard to walk. It was really hard to sleep. It was really hard to eat. It was everything to do hard above the 8,000 meter. It was tough of the K2. And that's why it's called like a death zone. So it was 2014, 26 July. We're so tired and it looks like from the top of the world, a top of the K2. The K2 second highest mountain in the world. And it has a, such a nickname like Killer Mountain, Savage Mountain, most dangerous mountain in the world, and King of the Mountain. But it is very special for me. It was my dream mountain. And we three Nepali women decided to climb this mountain in 2014 to promote women in adventure and also raise awareness of climate change. Technically, it is very dangerous mountain. One, of, one out of four people died under this mountain. But for us, it more challenging and difficult was the other part, like convincing family raising fund for this climb. When we said we are going to climb K2, and most of people thought we went crazy. And also some of the people, my friends, family told me like, are you crazy? You're supposed to stay home. Now you're married, you have a good husband. But we really wanted to climb this mountain. And second, it was really hard to raise fund because Nepal is a very small country, even a smaller mountain community. And it was very difficult to convince them what means is climbing, what means it's Exploring, exploring. Here is some picture. It's remote. It's remote. Lots of diff technical difficulties here. Lots of rock fall. Lots of avalanches. It's called like a pyramid. Hardest part. And this. It's like a dangerous part of the K2 bottleneck. So you can see the big Sarah hanging over you. It can collapse any time without warning. And in 2008, there were like 10 people killed here. And it called like a bottleneck. And he, there's no, no way to avoid that Sarah. And finally, 2014, 26 July, we were able to climb this mountain and became first Nepali, mountain, Nepali woman and also became first female team ever. In, in 60 years, only nine women climbed this mountain. So now I'd like to take you back how all my journey, how all this climbing started. Lukla, this is main gateway of Everest region. So I was born and grew up in Lukla. My childhood was very simple, very typical, like a blessed childhood. Like, but same time, like I, I was lucky to attend to school. So my school was very far, which is like 40 minutes walk each way every day. And that time we didn't have like any video, any video games, any TV, any internet, any Facebook, anything. So we, used, we just used to go like hide and like play outside, like. Uh, swimming in the river, that's kind of, but it was kind of fun. And but since my mother was uh, running the restaurant, so before school and after school, I had to go and help her. And also, look, a weekend, weekend, we had to. And this is the only one my childhood picture exists. Somebody found somewhere and sent it to me, so it's very special for me. 
and the weekend we had to Weekend we had to go jungle to collect the wood to help the parents. So my childhood was very difficult, but I think it, it was very fun. And I, I was born in the Sherpa family. And when I said like, I'm a like Pasang Lamu Sherpa, and people already uh, think that I climb mountain, and they start to ask about like, how many times you climb Everest? How many days, uh, time, how many days to take? Uh, climb Everest, but it's not true. Not all the Sherpa climb. Sherpa is uh, one of the ethnic, ethnic city in Nepal, and who lives in the mountain race, a small percentage people climb. And even in grew up in Sherpa family, even raising the Sherpa family, when I said I wanted to climb mountain, and uh, people like my family, friends, used to tell me that like, this is not your job. This is very hard, women cannot do this. Especially this is male job. So in our society, we women face lots of uh, boundaries and limitation. So there's women should do this, women shouldn't do this. And our, we never get support to do like outdoor things. We never get encouraged for this. Because they think this is just for male, not for the woman. And also mountaining is like a completely male dominated society. So as soon as I finished mountaineering, so I started working as a trekking guide. And since my climb, my dream was climbing mountain, I started taking mountaineering courses. So w during the tra uh, training period, I haven't seen any woman working on the mountain as a guide. And also what I noticed, like I have not see seen any single woman mountaineering instructor. In fact, there are like maybe one or two women trainees. And what I feel is like, it's very important to have women mountaineering instructor as well. Because in our society, you know, we, we women have lots of boundaries. And once the women reach age of like 18, 19, their parents immediately planning to get them married, have a kiss, and take her home. And also, what I feel is like, there would be more women tennis if there is a more woman instructor. There's no more parents will send their daughter when there's like all the trainees and male are instructor. So at the time being, I want, I decided to, I decided uh, to be like a mountain instructor. And also I decided to, uh, I decided to take uh, mountaining as my profession. In 2003, through lots of training in France, in Nepal, so I became first Nepali mountaineer instructor in Nepal. And age of 23, so I wanted to prove that women can also have a whole profession as a mountaineering guide. And here's uh, some picture, so these are some pictures, so most of the training, so I, I was just alone by myself, there's all men. And time of skill, that time I was like a most qualified woman guide in Nepal. But being as a woman, I had to face lots of challenges. Like, even I'm skillful, I wouldn't get hired for a big climb. Even I'm hired, but I, won't, I would be dedicated for the easier tasks. For example, I'll sh share some of my experience. This is the Nang Nangpai Gosu Mountain. It was like a Nepal-Japan uh, joint expedition. And I told, I, I told them, like, I wanted to climb this mountain with you guys. And the leader openly told me that they won't allow any woman in this trip. If I join, so I won't be allowed to go above the best camp. So I, anyhow, I can't miss them, so I joined with this expedition. As soon as I get on the best camp, I started working so hard. You, you can see that picture that I was carrying everything, I was cooking, I was uh, uh, fixing the rope, I was melting the water, I was feeding, and I still remember that when I was coming back from the top, and that leader told me that, oh, you're a strong woman. So it felt so good, because it was very important for me to prove myself that women also can climb this mountain. Then I started continue to do the training, and one day, 
I was teaching some mountaineering rescue uh, system for one, the trainees, who has been already Everest like three times. And he was telling me like, oh, what kind of system this? This, not, this kind of system not going to work in Everest. Everest is so different mountain. It's hard mountain. And that time I realized, oh, now I have to go climb Everest for my experience. It was my dream to climb Everest. And then uh, it became my necessity. And this is the Everest on the way to. And 2007, 16 May, I climbed Everest. And And then, then after I start, uh, I continue to uh, do training and climbing, and I went to United States as well. So when I went to United States, I feel much more comfortable there because there is like doesn't matter your mother, doesn't matter your daughter-in-law, doesn't matter your uh, girl. So you know you have like the same opportunity, equality. So I started working there as a mountain guide and teacher, and also then I went to South America and I went to Europe. Now I work uh, summer in summer in estate Europe and winter in South America in Nepal. And this is my favorite picture because so I was guiding in this mountain and there's like rest of this, all my clients were women. So I was very happy to see more women on the mountain. And then I was continuously working on the mountain and April uh, 2015, I was with my clients and we climbed one peak and I was near, near Everest Base Camp. And then suddenly this earthquake occurred so actually, we also caught gut by the avalanches, but luckily it was just powder avalanche, and we survived. <coughs> then uh, that moment, I thought of these people and the Everest. That moment, I forgot about like earthquake, and I, what I thought is like I need to help these people, and I ran to Everest towards Everest Base Camp, and Everest Base Camp situation was like that. It's completely devastated, and. 16, 17 people got killed. Some of my, my friends also lost their. And it was very painful for me because uh, 2014 also I saw like a big accident in Everest. And this time also I'm seeing this again. It was very hard. It was a very sad moment for me. And then I went for the rescue. And the next morning I fly, fly back to Kathmandu. But Kathmandu situation was more worse. Everybody sitting outside under the top, plastic and there was no water sources. It was a very hard life in Kathmandu and around the Kathmandu. And then that moment when I came to Kathmandu, I, uh, I found like my family are safe and I'm safe. Uh, what I realized is like, I can't be killed anywhere. My f family are safe, I'm safe. So I think it has a one reason to do. So then I told my husband that like, now we have to help these people. And then we immediately start to Going out of Kathmandu, you can see this village. It's like a Gorkha. Where is the center point? Near center point, the whole 600 house collapsed. They they didn't have any place to stay. And the houses are more like this everywhere. And then we immediately start to taking the earthquake aid and and place near Kathmandu like Gorkha, Labra. There's different places. We took uh, food. Uh, blankets, medical, and that time it was very hard for us is like getting stuff and also taking stuff because there are so many places in the remote area we didn't have a good transportation and the most of the road is like served by this landslide. And that time, so uh, my experience uh, working with the porter in the mountain and uh, expedition became very helpful, and that moment, I and my other friends, Benegar's brother, brought the idea of portal mobilization because that time helicopter was so expensive, and it was very hard to get. And then we start to mobilize the porter, and also we use mules, porters, and this is the picture to going Labrak. So, it's from Kathmandu. It, it took like ten hours drive and two two days walk, and we're taking all this blanket, mattress, using this uh, porter, 
who is already affected by earthquakes. So the idea was very simple. So we, instead of paying the helicopter, we paid this porter to create the job opportunity for them. And also there was that time when we visited like very remote area that most affected is like girls, uh, women, pregnant women are older. And then also we started taking this special kit for the women. And also we're very happy now today. Uh, we're able to build some temporary shelter for elders who doesn't have anyone and who, who's like a disabled, who cannot build shelter by themselves. So these, these are the blind women and blind men. And there's like a 16 of them. So we built a temporary shelter and I tried to help. And the project is still running. And then winter, we distribute lots of like a blanket, more than like 13,000 blanket. And we did like uh, lots of uh, health camp. And we treated more than 4,000 people. And we still do this uh, <coughs> health camp. Every, uh, And then, yeah, so when I choose the mountaineering, it was very hard for me then. But now, today, I'm very thankful to this mountain. Because, mount, because of mountain, I'm here today sharing experience with you. And because of mountain, I was able to connect the people from all over the world. And I was able to help when my country and my people in pain. And I was, I'm always thankful this mountain. And after 2015, so I was nominated for the National Geographic Adventure of the Year. So I got the, the title in 2016, February, and also some other international <laughs> awards. And so uh, it was a very special moment for me after having this, getting this title. So I'm getting lots of messages. Even I'm getting messages from Afghanistan and Pakistan. The women, the girls saying that, your story is so inspired. Now I'm glad to read your, share your uh, story. So I want to follow my dream no matter what. So this moment is very special for me. And so from my experience and from my uh, work, what I learned and what I really like to give a message for the youth is like, do really what, what you really want to. Go explore yourself. Follow your dream. So when I was, when, when I started, when I was dreaming about mountaineering, become mountaineering guy, woman mountain guide, I had also self-doubt that I'm not able to do this. Because there are so many challenges. I didn't have any encourage. I didn't get any guidance. guidance but I try, at least. And uh, now I, I was able to achieve my goals. So for, uh, unless you try, you won't know what's going to happen. So at least you have to try, because there is nothing impossible. Thank you so much.